My name is Mikey Mahenda. I'm happy that you're all here. If you take any photos of today's talk, please tag us. Also tag VCU Qatar and uh, the Tasmeem Festival um, so that we can see what you like and share and let everybody know. This, I'm very proud to say, is part of our uh, year-long series that we are doing with Tasmeem Doha. And if possible, uh, Basma, if you can turn on your camera and unmute yourself, I will pass it over to Basma Hamdi, uh, who can tell you a little bit about the festival. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Basma Hamdi, and I'm one of the four directors of Tasmeem Doha 2022, Radical Futures. So on behalf of my co-directors, Dr. Daniil Emmons, Dr. Diane Durr, and Maisa al Mutmin, I would like to express how honored and excited we are for this collaboration with Afikra. Together, we have designed a series of conversations leading up to Tasmeem in March. Some of these topics include the future of education, the future of the Arab image, of language and typography, the future of food, among others. We felt it was important to lead with tonight's discussion as decolonization kept coming up during our discussions when planning for the conference. So we believe it will lay the foundation for all future conversations. We're honored and excited to be joined by two leading figures in art and design in the Swana region, Hiba Amin and Mohammed al-Shahid. A bit about Tasmeem. Tasmeem Doha is an international bien biennial art and design conference hosted and organized by VCU Arts Qatar since 2004. Each edition of Tasmeem Doha highlights a unique and contemporary theme with an art and design, exploring novel concepts, methods, and applications, and engaging in critical discussions. The event is open to the public with attendees and participants consisting of international designers, artists, academics, students, industry professionals, and the local community. The 2022 conference, Radical Futures, addresses the role of design in shaping the future. Uh, Radical Futures is an, inclusive, is an inclusive and multifaceted view of the future, one that not only speculates on technological advancements, but on future threats and changes, whether environmental, geographical, cultural, or social. Thank you. Great. Okay. Um, there will be a Q&A at the end, so if you have any questions, type them into the chat, and then at the very end, I will ask you to unmute and turn on your camera and ask them. With that, we'll get started introducing our two very special guests, uh, Muhammad Al-Shahid and Hiba Y. Amin. Um, uh, Muhammad is a curator and architectural historian focusing on the modernism in Egypt and the Arab world. He earned his master's from MIT's Aga Khan Program for Islamic Architecture and a PhD from NYU's Department of Middle Eastern Studies. His work spans architecture, design, and material culture. He is a curator of the British Museum's Modern Egypt Project and Egypt's Winning Pavilion, Modernist Ind Indignation, at the 2018 London Design Biennale. 2019, Apollo Magazine named him among the 40 under 40 influential thinkers and artists in the Middle East. 2011, he co-founded CairoObserver.com with six printed issues of the magazine by the same name distributed for free events in Cairo, Beirut, and Dubai, which aim to stimulate public debates around the issues of architecture, heritage, and urbanism in the region. He's the co-author, or he's the author of Cairo Since 1900, an architectural guide from AUC Press, um, the first comprehensive survey of Cairo's modern architecture. Hibba is a professor of digital and time-based art at ABK Stuttgart, the co-founder of the Black Athena Collective, curator of visual art for the Mizna Journal, and currently sits on the editorial board of the Journal of Digital War. She was awarded the 2020 Sussman Artist Award for artists committed to the ideals of democracy a democracy and anti-fascism, and was selected as a Field of Vision Fellow, New York City, 2019. Hiba's work has been shown in numerous exhibitions, including the Mosaic Room, London, the Butch, I'm going to butcher this uh, prize. <laughs> Sorry, I had to make the joke. Um, I'm not sure how to say that name, uh, but it's a prize exhibition. In German... Say that again. Butcherstrasse Prize. Thank you so much. I film Museum Amsterdam 2020, along with many, many others. Um, I'm so happy that both of you are here. Thank you so much for joining this conversation. Thank you for having us. OK, so this is going to be fun. You guys have done a lot of things. Um, and as you can tell from that intro, the word uh, sort of modern and uh, modernism is sort of like thrown around a lot 
you're, you are two scholars who are both concerned um, with the past, the present, and the future. So let's talk about the title of this discussion and how it could mm -hmm. mean nothing at all, okay? So future of decolonization. Uh, Hibba, maybe we can start with you and ask you a question, uh, a precise question, and then we can have Hamma chime in. How often do you think of the term decolonization <laughs> from a, a, a week to week basis when you're thinking about your work and thinking about uh, the, the questions that you're sort of wrangling as you sort of work on the many different projects? Well, I would have to say, unfortunately, all the time because it's yeah. <laughs> down our throat, whether we like it or not. Um, and this is why, I mean, exactly as you're saying, um, a term uh, that is very heavy but can mean absolutely nothing because it's used um, in, in many ways, um, often very superficial ways. Um, and, and yet we find ourselves often having to fit our work within these contexts, especially um, as artists who are working with colonial content, global South content, especially in Western institutions. Um, and so um, I deal with this word very delicately, although I'm very <laughs> often categorized directly under this term with my work. Um, and yet I always um, am adamant about um, addressing the ways in which I find it incredibly problematic um, and maybe even um, in many ways um, counterproductive, even though the idea um, is a beautiful idea, uh, uh, but the way that it manifests currently, um, I think we have to be very kind of um, aware of. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 yeah. yeah, I think one of the, when, when, I, when you invited us to this talk, I, initially, you know, the first thought was, what do we mean by future? What do we mean by decolonization? But also, how do we talk about these things without understanding what is the history of the future and what is the history of decolonization? Um, um, it, it cannot, uh, I cannot stress enough that um, everything that we experience today has the thumbprint of some version of the past on it. And so in order to be able to understand your own present, your own life, you really need to decipher where did this come from? I mean. Um, if we think about colonial, one way to think about colonialism, for example, for the past five, six hundred years is the capacity to own the past, the capacity to own not only the past in material terms, but also the capacity to own the very um, possibility of telling the story of the past. I mean, this is why we end up in these ongoing, uh, you know, critical debates, uh, you know, some are more amateur than others and everybody should be participating and not be, you don't need to be, you, you need to be a conscious human being, I think, to participate in these conversations, not uh, someone with a PhD. There are plenty of PhD people who teach socialism and anti-colonialism in the classroom, but then they go out and they continue their tenured uh, sabbatical, whatever, well-paid position, um, you know, accepting to some degree that they do perform uh, the role of a token. Um, and so how to be aware of these things, uh, all of this is connected. And what I'm trying to say is a lot of our work is actually trying to grapple with aspects of the past that tell us a lot about our present and therefore yeah. uh, how we can imagine the future. So I actually want to, this is a perfect um, jump. So I want to talk about this idea of like past futures, right? So um, you put together this project, Cairo Past Futures. Um, and I, I want to ask you like a very pointed question. Um, if, you, if you sort of go back in time to when you were a student, an undergraduate, mm. um, and because you were alluding to this idea that there is misconceptions. There are people who sort of, this just like goes right over their head. Um, how quickly, how soon into your sort of studies did you realize that there was this concept of past futures and how the, the idea of future is also an ident a dynamic construction? Yeah. Um, when did this sort of come online and how has it changed over the course of your career? Um, I'd like to rather talk about the development of the course of my like human development rather sure. than my career. Because um, I feel like regardless of what we do uh, in terms to, to, to pay rent or whatever, <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, you know, what are you thinking and what does that have, how does that contribute to your um, reading of yourself in the world, but also the world around you, right? So I, I'd rather 
and this was something that came up in my undergrad studies. Um, you know, I was drawn to architecture from a very young age. Uh, my father was a draftsperson, a draftsman, uh, someone who draws architectural drawings before, you know, the, these things were automated or made digital. For example, he was a victim of this, uh, you know, he didn't have the skills, but he was also a soldier, um, you know, whose life who was born during colonial rule. We have to remember that when we talk about colonialism, whether we are children of those places that were colonized or um, children of the places that were recipients uh, or beneficiaries of this colonial project. We're sometimes talking about people who are as close as our parents, right? You know, some people's parents alive right now were in World War II. Some people alive right now were victims of things that already uh, were manifested because of colonialism within recent memory, right? And so I say this because um, you know, what brought me to architecture was, you know, maybe my environment, maybe my father, um, maybe other things. But what brought me to architecture school in the United States was immigration, immigration that was triggered by, again, real ongoing political events like the Gulf War. We lived in Kuwait. Um, you know, that ended an entire generation of immigrants from places like Egypt who found themselves back home. Uh, you know, what is home? Um, and eventually many of us uh, from this generation, and it's a story that we can, you know, there are many people that I've met that have had very similar benchmark, right? Benchmarks, born in the late 70s, early 80s, lived in the Gulf, but they were probably from Palestine, Jordan, uh, Syria, Egypt, Sudan, whatever. Uh, Gulf War somehow manifested in their lives in a way that turned them into immigrants somewhere else and so on. So it's important to think about your life not as a unique series of events. They are unique in some ways, but they also fit within a pattern and within a larger story. Um, so all of this together, uh, in my undergraduate schools uh, meant a few things. I was already very aware of having a foot in multiple worlds, whereas most of the other students who were not necessarily international students, um, you know, their perception of the world was very different. So you have to kind of come to terms with that. I realized that the things that brought me to architecture were completely invisible from the story that we were told. And I, when that sort of manifested in then the desire to fill that gap and say, hey, I exist, I have a story too, I have a history too, that is part of the larger story. Um, and uh, the third thing was looking at my friends who were so eager to get into the professional uh, world by sort of getting their hands busy and realizing what they were actually doing. Everybody was being sort of prepared to be a genius artist, even though the first thing you do as a student is to open magazines, see what other people have done, look at the past, right? There's no such thing as genius. Nobody just sits and, you know, gets something out of nothing. You know, this is very cartoonish, a notion of where ideas come from. We're always pulling from something. This is, again, why the past becomes important, because if everything I have access to as a student in the magazines, in the history books, in the resources that are available, um, show a past that's supposed to be a past that we all claim as ours, but it's a very particular slice of reality that doesn't include my story, the story of the you know, the Guyanese guy next, sitting next to me or, you know, the Congolese woman sitting behind me or whatever, you know what I mean? We, where are our stories? And therefore, you know, to, to actually think of the future, to design something new, uh, you really need to have as wide a possible access to many versions of the past, right? Um, again, so this is kind of where my ideas of who I am what brought me to this particular place? What brought me to architecture? What is my story? How does it fit within a larger story? All of these became very clear to me within, I would say, third year in undergrad. That's when I decided not to go on. You know, when I saw that the, gene, the, the students who had a lot of optimism about their sort of design abilities were spending hours and hours and hours drawing toilets and floor plans for someone else's really mundane designs that are actually shaped by very different realities, economic, political, where the ideas the flourishing at the creative bit is completely suppressed because in the end of the day, you know, you need to get this much profit out of this square footage and you need to do it as cheaply as possible and you need to, you know, minimize the cost of labor so that somebody makes more money. These are the realities. So here you are as a student being pulled by the separate realities of where you are and where you've come from, your story and the bigger story, what your dreams are as a creative person and then what the realities that are shaped by politics and money, which is what architecture is. Um, are, uh, are saying, you know, needs to be produced. So it's these kinds of conflicts. And what I just want to say on this note is awareness and perception 
you know, when we have traumatic experiences like being displaced uh, because of a war or whatever it may be, um, you know, I was in New York as an undergrad when 9-11 happened. And, um, you know, one of the things that I remember confronting very soon after was one of the design studio professors who was just had something for me, you know. At the time, you don't understand what these things are exactly 100% when you're deep in them. But they connected to everything I was already saying just now and how I was thinking about my reality. And having to survive experiences like this can really be an open way, an open door to widening your perception, which I think is really what we're all aiming for, is to widen your perception, broaden your horizon, understand, in, in, enlarge your circle of empathy, uh, enlarge your conception of the past, and therefore the present, because a lot of people live today in a present in which they're not really paying attention. Uh, and I feel like the first step to decolonization, if colonialism is really about creating illusions, uh, distractions, and material wants, then, you know, on a personal level, decolonization is really about snapping out of it and paying attention. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, I want to respond and try to get Hiba to take, uh, to take ownership of something that you just said. <laughs> which is a hard thing to do. But I want to I want to see if you can uh, if this makes sense. So Hamad just said something. He said, essentially, you have to as an artist or an architect, you're constantly um, being inspired and doing things in reference to the past. Right. There's no there aren't these new ideas that you just come out of out of nowhere. So if our past in this region, if we have a colonial past in this region, it's inescapable. Um, how do you think about this problematic term of decolonization. How can we, like, if we, if our work is referencing this colonial past, how do you even think about this in a productive, effective, positive way? Um, you specifically, you. How do you think about this? How does your work sort of? Um, well, I think the that? starting point, whether we are aware of it or not, in this contemporary moment, we're all products of um, the project of European universal knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we start there, that everything we know and everything that we've learned is within that construct of the project of European universal knowledge. Um, to add to that, in our region, um, colonized in various ways, uh, but even in a very contemporary context, we're all going to, um, at least I can speak on behalf of Muhammad and I, have gone to Western schools. So our, our education was framed within a very Western context. We both went to the United States to study. And so our framework was within the vision of European universal knowledge. Now, only in recent years um, has information become more available due to the hard work of a lot of people, but also due to technological tools and digitization of archives. And this is why a lot of um, artists and academics are now, you know, this is why archives is like the big topic and mm -hmm. research practice is the big topic, is that we suddenly have access to material that were locked up in colonial institutions who very adamantly did not give us access to our own histories. So we're only starting the work of starting to uncover our own stories, our own histories that we ourselves never learned. Um, and so I think this is where the shifting discourse is happening. Yeah. And so as an artist, um, I'm very much uh, motivated by this as many artists are. And Can I think many artists from the region are working. Yeah. This can you actually tie this into this project of yours? Um, the Earth is an imperfect ellipsoid, because I think this actually ties in really beautifully to what you're, what you, the notion that you're describing, which is um, taking a look at quote unquote our history, right? That predates um, colonialism, um, and thinking about how that can, um, thinking about how that can sort of shape how we think about the world that we live in right now. So could you give a sort of a brief uh, on what this project was and how what I said may or may not be total rubbish or total uh, a good a description of what it is all about? No, I mean, I think speaking to Muhammad's point, um, the idea is that we are byproducts of a con context. Nothing emerges out of a void. And yeah. this project for me emerged out of um, the so-called crisis of um, you know, Afri African migration um, to Europe, um, being framed as, as, a, as a European crisis. Um, and I was interested to understand beyond a contemporary context of, okay, 
the conversation does not start at the migrants drowning at sea or the migrants coming to Europe, but rather there's a, a more fundamental and deep rooted um, systemic problem that is forcing people to flee um, these territories. And this goes centuries and centuries back, right? Um, and so we have to acknowledge those histories. And in doing that research, I came across um, an 11th century manuscript because now there is a wave of um, Islamic manuscripts from the 10th and 11th centuries that are being digitized and that are suddenly accessible from um, my computer. I don't have to go to French colonial institutions or German colonial institutions to get permissions to access them and probably be denied. Um, and uh, this text uh, was an interesting um, text by Al Bakri called um, the the book of uh, the book Roads and Kingdoms. Roads and Kingdoms. Sorry. Yeah. Um, and it was the first comprehensive text describing um, the geography of West Africa in, in the 11th century. And it was basically um, content that was gathered by um, an Arab Andalusian. Uh, um, a geographer named Al Bakri, who was putting together a book uh, by merchants and traders and travelers who, who are describing these regions, and I was really kind of struck by the lyrical, um, uh, the lyrical form of this text, which is quite similar to a lot of the texts that were written at that time, but very specifically the ways in which women's bodies were being written into um, the text as a sort of geography. And so I took a journey, a six month journey um, in West Africa from Nigeria to Berlin along migration routes, the exact same paths that young migrants are taking today, which turn out to be the same paths that merchants and traders were taking in the 10th and 11th century. Incredible. And I started to understand better my problematic role in that, but how do I contextualize this history by becoming the same voyeur like the merchant and the trader who's kind of um, objectifying the landscapes and the bodies that are, are, are in this region as a way to kind of position myself um, with a critical eye um, to how we narrate these stories. So ultimately the project becomes about um, you know, the very narrow ways in which we contextualize these things in a contemporary context. And in fact, the media is presenting something so superficial, so shallow that we can't begin to understand or empathize for that matter. I think, Mohammed, that's a, a very important word that you raised um, to our current conflict. So really my work becomes about using the history to reshape the future narratives of our contemporary context. Yeah. I wanted to jump in actually on something Please. that that the Heba talked about, because it reminded me of the project that I just uh, opened in New York. Um, you know, I created this timeline. I wanted to contextualize uh, in terms of imagery and sources and what comes out and who owns what, because I think actually this is super important to actually thinking about the future and the present and the colonial past and all of this. Um, you know, so in this timeline, I wanted to contextualize the, this, you know, set of buildings that I'm showcasing in the exhibition within a larger history. And it was something that you can do in an exhibition because you need a, a large wall to do something like this. You can't really fit it in a book, which is why these projects, uh, you know, similar sets of ideas can actually manifest in different ways. You know, a book at the end of the day cannot 100% replace an exhibition An exhibition does something else. But one of the things that actually I thought about that maybe we can talk about this later is how, because of this, um, uh, it's a tangential point, but because of this sort of uh, foot in Zoom and foot in the real world again, yeah. we created a very accurate model of the exhibition before uh, it happened. And uh, and when it, once it manifested, uh, you know, I realized that, well, maybe the future of exhibitions can be completely in virtual reality where we actually can build entire spaces, you know, without wasting cardboard, without wasting the materials, without underpaid labor or standing for hours. We can just actually create full exhibitions in virtual reality, at least for certain topics, right? At least yeah. for certain and um, whatever. So that's one thing to think about. But in order to do this, you need images. And so when I created the timeline, I wanted to include some images. A lot of them were public domain, but interestingly, the ones that had to do with apartheid in South Africa, um, theft of antiquity, um, you know, the, the, the finding of Nefertiti, for example, uh, colonialism in general, those are owned by things like the New York Times, National Geographic, the Getty. They're not in public domain. And I found that to be fascinating. Uh, that actually in order to educate the public about these issues, eventually you will hit a corporation slash institution 
whatever uh, that on the front side of things is, you know, a keeper of, of knowledge of information, but also it operates as a sort of corporate entity in which the poor brown person trying to educate the public about these things will need to pay the Getty Institute an institution that in one way or another, or whatever, I'm not picking on a particular institution, but you know, all of these institutions in one way or another benefited. They were in the territories um, you know, that are beneficiaries of the colonial project. You know, the wealth that came into a lot of it one way or another. So it's ironic that in order to talk about these issues, I need to pay those institutions in order to show those images, which are the most effective way to communicate these issues right this is why when i speak always to people about colonialism i tell them this is not that old um and history is not a linear progression it's not something that you can slavery that is not something you can just put behind you and move on colonialism is not something you can put behind you and move on and in fact when you don't do that you realize that how they manifest in, in, in sort of ways that are contemporaneous with our lives. I think when people think colonialism until today, they think of certain images, right? Because those are the images that they have ad, had access to. Those are the mental uh, post-it notes that they can pull from. Um, and those images look a particular way. So the assumption is if that kind of image is not manifesting today in that way, which in some places it is, you know, soldiers on the ground, uh, mistreatment of prisoners and uh, whatever, these things are actually happening, right? This is old, old, old fashioned colonialism, one to one, nothing has changed there. But in other ways, it has developed, it has become more invisible. Um, and so imagery, how to connect the dots, how to make the public aware of how their presence is actually related to a very recent and distant past. And it is a knowledge of this, it is an awareness of this that will only determine the future. Otherwise, we're just riding on somebody else's bus who has a clear idea of some version of the future. Uh, and we're not really participants, except for having our data collected in order to manifest that future, of course. So um, I want to squeeze in two last questions, one for each of you, and then we're going to move to a quick Q&A and then open it up to everybody. So those of you who have a question, definitely type it in the chat now to make sure that uh, we get to you. So um, Mohammed, I'll actually ask you, uh, I'll stay with you for a second. Um, insofar as you wrote this book, Cairo since 1900. Um, yeah. So that's a 120 year um, span. Um, during which the idea of what the future might look like changed. So I want you to try to give us a little insight. How did the idea of the future change from 1900 to now? Um, well, yeah. It's a hard question to ask, but just give us a glimpse so that we know where to start. Because yeah. in the Q&A, there'll be some questions about this, but give us a little bit of a glimpse. How did uh, the conception of the future change and how was it informed by the colonial project and how yeah. has it sort of unwound or wound up in a different way over the yeah. 120 years? Yeah. Okay, well, I mean, I think a good way to think about it is today, looking, standing today, being aware and paying attention just for a moment, which is not how we, how we operate from the minute to minute, right? But pause and take it and then try to imagine what in your own mind, from what you already know, what do you think the next 50 year has to bring? Um, and I bet everybody listening, you know, the 61 people, they'll have 61 different versions. There might be overlaps because they are building on certain, uh, you know, uh, pop culture, uh, whatever stream of information that's helping them shape that vision of the future. How much are they actually producing themselves and, and imagining themselves in the future? That's very difficult to determine. I have no idea. You know, if you asked anyone in 1900, can you imagine that in 50 years, uh, you know, uh, something like the atom bomb will have happened, uh, something like the Holocaust will have happened, uh, that there will be, uh, you know, this, uh, whatever, you know, airplanes are going to be accessible to a much wider span of people than the, you know, the few people who have experimented with flight at that point. It's very difficult. I mean, it might sound like science fiction. It might, you know, we can, we are prisoners of our own realities is what I'm trying to say. So whatever we try to imagine um, when we talk about the future is going to be a product of our present. So using your question to go back and look at this material, what I find really interesting is, well, first of all, it's very difficult to answer because the sources are very limited, right? We don't really know what many of these people thought. 
Um, and this is actually a, a cycle that perpetuates itself. That doesn't mean that they didn't think, um, right? That didn't mean that they didn't, have a, they didn't have a project, a vision for the future, fears about the future. But the fact that we don't know actually allows us to perpetuate certain things. You know, I, I empathize with a figure that is very prominent in the book, who is Saeed Karim. And I talk about him all the time. And it's because I actually find a lot of empathy towards him because he's a, someone who had a lot of dreams, a lot of visions, political and colonial realities directly impacted his life, being put under house, house arrest, having his office shut down, uh, but living 40, 40 years more after that. You know, these are people that I know right now who are lingering in prison, uh, who are, are having their life stolen from them, right? They're not able to manifest. Um, their potential. Um, and so the buildings that are in the book, it's not really about um, trying to correct an image about, look, we too had modernism. That should be a given. Modernism has always been a, glo a global project. The problem has been with people who have rooted the reading of modernism as something exclusionary. Um, you know, it's hard for me to look at, you know, gilded buildings in Brussels and not think of genocide in the Congo. That's not what most people are thinking, right, when they're taking selfies in front of these buildings. Uh, you know, it's, so connecting these things together, thinking about what are the political realities that have shaped these buildings, and then talk about them in just straightforward ways. You know, this is what it looked like. This is who did it as far as we know. This is how people used it as far as we know. And that's it. And move on. This is not about... Uh, putting um, a handful of specimens in sort of the European project of art historical glorification of de decontextualization. We don't want to do that. If we want to talk about the future of decolonization, then let's not repeat the mechanisms of colonization when we produce our own knowledge. Let's not decontextualize things. Let's not make the political realities and economic realities that have produced material things invisible when we tell their stories. This is the received knowledge that we've had, right? Where those things are taken out of the narrative. Let's not you know, whitewash, pinkwash, whatever wash, uh, certain figures because they serve uh, someone in a particular way. You know, if they were racist, say they were racist. You know, if, if you know, if, if they were entangled in, um, in power networks, uh, and so let's say that, that is part of the story. When we don't do that, we, we, we create problems. So anyway, so my project in the book here is to just say, there's a different way of not only introducing new material, but also reading it and potentially thinking about our built environment and past, present and future in a way. Okay. Yes. Great. Um, Hiba, I, I would be remiss if I didn't talk to you about this project because I'm, I'm fascinated by it. Um, so this project, The General Stork, is largely about uh, drones. Um, which is a which feels like a very 21st century it has there's an illusion that it's a very 21st century uh, issue um, but on the cover of this uh, of this book is um, General Allenby a uh, very colonial figure um, a pr almost prototypical colonial figure so if you could talk to us a little bit about a why his image on the cover of the project seemed apropos um, to you and to why the issue of drones is is not really a 21st century problem. Well, first to your first question, I mean, look at this image. It's amazing. <laughs> it's an incredible image. How can it not be the cover of the book? Uh, no, I mean, I think <laughs> I think this book actually kind of attempts to do exactly what Muhammad was saying that his book is attempting to do. Is like, how do we make these connections and be really straightforward about um, these very complex histories that have otherwise been um, relayed um, quite differently? Um, and so this book is really about looking at the colonial context of drone warfare. Of course, when I started this project, I didn't realize that this is where it was going to take me. It was really a project about a bird, a stork that was captured in Egypt um, and accused of being a Zionist spy and imprisoned um, in a human jail. <laughs> and it was an absurd media story. It was funny. But I was interested in looking at, you know, where this paranoia comes from. And I'm just to kind of continue on the themes that we've been talking about, this idea that these are things that, um, again, do not occur in a void. You have to contextualize them. And sure enough, when I started digging into the source of the paranoia, 
it became very clear it's not so strange that a bird uh, would be deemed a threat um, uh, as a spy. Um, there's a very kind of clear historical narrative that would support that. Um, and that historical narrative led me not just to the history of, colo uh, of um, colonial warfare and the fact that drones and the technology, technology of drone warfare emerged directly out of a colonial context, directly in our geographies, meaning um, uh, Palestine and Egypt, um, but it actively um, shaped the geopolitical context of the region. It plays a very important role in the politics that we're living today. And so through sort of a sense of humor, um, a bit tongue in cheek, using these funny birds as the book ends of um, telling a very complicated story, a story that's otherwise um, difficult to talk about, it could, it's risky to talk about, um, and it's, it's, um, it's heavy. Um, this becomes a way um, to use these peculiar um, historical artifacts. Uh, I've found many wonderful images, many that I unfortunately, Muhammad, I had to pay for through um, stock footage <laughs> sites, um, and um, many that I dug up uh, through other means um, as a way to tell that story. Um, and so I think it attempts to do the same thing, is we have to look at these historical narratives um, to contextualize a present in order to reshape uh, the future narrative. Amazing. Um, okay, so we're going to transition, although I could talk to you both for hours. Um, I'm going to transition into a quick Q&A. I will cut you off after a minute because I don't want to, um, I want to give enough time for both <laughs> of you. Um, so let's start first with the first question and we'll do Hiba then Hamad. Um, <laughs> so Hiba, what are you reading or watching right now? You know, that's not an easy question because I think I'm one of those people that is like notoriously buying tons of books that I think yeah. I'm going to read and I never get to and I have such a long list. But really, I think essentially, given the type of work that I do, I'm just very much invested in the research of the projects that I'm doing. But if I can reference a book that I would highly recommend to the audience um, uh, pertaining to the research I'm doing on just how absurd colonial mentality really is, is to read the book uh, Invasion of the Sea by Jules Verne from 1908. It talks about a, a French, a, a real proposal by a French geographer to move the Sahara, um, to move the Mediterranean Sea into the Sahara Desert. And one mm -hmm. of my projects is based on, on this proposal. Perfect. We have a running list of recommendations, so that's a perfect addition. OK, Muhammad, go for it. So I actually uh, have next to me a couple of, well, the books that I'm flipping through. And I would want to desperately want to mention this to everyone because it's been an eye opener. It's called Shamanism, Colonialism, and the Wild Man, um, a study in terror and healing. It, um, it's by a Columbia University anthropologist who did work in uh, what is today Colombia, Peru, uh, around indigenous people who are descendants of basically one of the early 20th century genocides that we didn't get to hear much about, was perpetuated by the British um, to get rubber, just like uh, since the Congo was already taken by the Belgians. So anyways, it's an interesting story. Um, it's fascinating. It's difficult to read. I really think it's, um, uh, you know, Colonialism touches everyone. You know, um, the British man, gentleman, who was sent to the Congo to write a report, uh, you know, 1916 was hung for different reasons uh, for being homosexual. Uh, so the person that we, and he's the same person who wrote the report on the genocides, um, also for rubber in the Congo. So those famous pictures of uh, Congolese men sort of looking at the severed um, limbs of their children, that's, that's, that's this man, right? Uh, and that's a white British gentleman who happens to be homosexual. And another reason for the dominant, uh, you know, heteronormative, um, you know, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, that's another victim. I just want to say, you know, that's, that's that those kinds of intersectionalities will come out, I think, in fascinating stories like this. I just want to suggest a couple of others since I have the chance. 
Eduardo Galeano is someone that I read in this past year that I found to be fascinating. I was drawn through a lot of personal things, but also to open up my eyes to our general world and the political view uh, situation in the Middle East. And I think looking at Latin America in the 70s, reading from um, you know witnesses of what happened in Latin America in the 70s and 80s can shed quite a lot of light uh, on our present Middle East. And the other man that saved me this year was James Baldwin. Uh, I just picked this up. Uh, this is what I was reading when I was in New York, The Devil Finds Work. It's him uh, watching Hollywood films and sort of having his own young black boy perception of these white characters on the silver screen. And I also have Heba's book. So that was a beautiful read recently as well. <laughs> beautiful. OK, so I'm going to, I think I'm going to only ask you both one of the, these questions. So um, let's do this. Um, and I'll start with you, Muhammad, because Hiba just gave me a, <laughs> a, a scared look. So who would you love to shadow for a day, past or present? If you can do it in two sentences, that would be great. I have an answer. Uh, the name is Terence McKenna. Fascinating character. Uh, another person that I've been listening hours and hours to in the past year, spent hours and you know, months in the Amazon exploring. Uh, you know, um, pre-colonial medicine, plant culture, and its effect on the psyche. And oh my God, if I can spend a day with that man, yes. <laughs> Amazing. Terence McKenna. Yeah. You know. Okay. Hebo. I have a bit of a like a different kind of yeah. response, um, and it might sound a bit morbid, but maybe it's because I'm just kind of fascinated to better understand what this mental mentality is about. But I've, I've, I've been doing a lot of research on historical um, speeches, and I'm always fascinated by Mussolini's speeches, I'm kind of shocked by them. And I think merely just to kind of better understand, like, who is this character behind this persona, um, just to maybe thwart things, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, or better understand uh, what is to come uh, after this, this person. It's a Amazing. bit of a morbid response, maybe. No, it's perfect. <laughs> Okay, so um, Hamad, we'll jump back to you. And I think this is a, a very instructive question. Um, mm -hmm. What do people most misunderstand about your work? Um, well, um, I would say, I think one of the experiences that I can link several you know, things that have, in, have happened in my work and life and thinking in the past 10 years, for example, is realizing uh, the difference between the interface of everything and the back end of everything, right? So on the front, we want a poster, you know, you buy a product and there's a beautiful Latino man or woman on the cover and, or on the advertisement or on the product and you think, I'm included, you know, I see myself. But at the end, the back end is, you know, a bunch of, you know, money hungry, like, corporate dudes in, in, in suits who are probably all the same race. And my own interaction, and I say this is because my own interaction with several institutions have revealed that while on the front of things, there may be an openness towards something like decolonization through work of people like myself and others. I think in the end of the day, in a structural system that has donors who have their own political interests, and if you have money in this environment, most likely you're on the conservative side of things, uh, and, and so on. The mechanisms that really operate behind you know, the machinery of institutions so in that context, I would say what I think uh, people you know, misunderstand about my work is that I'm happy to be a token and I, it really bothers me uh, when that's the perception. You know, if you're going to actually give someone a platform to do their work, then let them say what they have to say. Um, you know, you cannot claim post-colonialism and fly first class. You cannot claim post-colonialism and be an a-hole to people around you, <laughs> you know, or look the other way to uh, labor abuses and, and these kinds of practices. So I think what I would say is there's a misunderstanding that there's a lot of us who are willing to do these kinds of yeah. moral, uh, moral um, compromises. So I'm not. <laughs> uh, Hiba? I mean, tokenization is a big one uh, that Mohammed brings up, but I think people, a lot of people don't understand my work, period. <laughs> I often get the question of like, I see your activity on social media, but what is it that you do exactly? And you're like, the, the shorter list is what do people understand? <laughs> work? Yeah, because they see that it has this kind of silly, humorous, absurd front. Um, and, and I yeah. think people oftentimes don't get that it's dealing with much more serious topics. But I don't mind that either. 
Um, and so I think uh, there's different ways to enter enter my work, and I hope that um, people enter it through various ways. I, I hope at least it piques their curiosity. Is it uh, before we get into the questions? Because this actually, I'm very curious about this. Are are both of you, and either of you can answer this question. Are you, are both of you primarily concerned with creating mass understanding, or primarily concerned with understanding something for yourself. I don't think you can do the two separately. Yeah, I, both. Think, I think these are intended. I think the more you've got it together, the more the more you'll notice that these two are deeply entangled. I think mm -hmm. the the en enlightenment thinking that says let's deal with these things in sort of an elaboratory environment in your head separate from the other things so they can really yeah. dissect it. That's not really how it works, I think. Yeah, so understanding is understanding. Yeah, and also we both use very different means. I mean, yeah. for me, education and teaching is also a very big part of my practice. Um, yeah. That's one, um, but we both do exhibitions, we both do writing, we both do, you know, so I think there's just various formats in which you can reach different audiences and that's all important. Absolutely, okay. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Bernadette if you can un, uh, turn on your camera as well and then ask your question. Hi, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. Thank you for um, well all the great things you already shared with us. Um, I was wondering, um, maybe this is a que question you get asked um, a lot. Um, so I'm sorry if it's, um, well, if it's- uh, cool. <laughs> I would be um, interested um, what are your experiences with working um, within European institutions or uh, US institutions while also working on, well, the themes of uh, decolonization? Um, are there certain demands you make? Are there strategies? Because, yeah, I would assume it would bring tension as well, or, um, yeah, I would be curious. Great. Thanks, Bernadette. Who wants to take it? Would you like to start? Well, I think it triggers something a little bit schizophrenic in us and that we end up working with the very institutions whose systems we're critiquing and that's a very troubling place to be. I think there's a lot of things to grapple with and contemplate that on the one hand, you want to enter these institutions in order to play and role in, in changing those systems and those narratives. Um, on the other hand, you don't want to be um, a pawn of the very systems that you're um, problematizing. And at the same time, um, you're often funded by these kinds of institutions. So I think for me, what's really important is to problematize that at the forefront and always address my positioning in that. Um, yeah. so I'm, I never, I'm never afraid to address when my positioning is problematic, but then how do I use that um, to either subvert um, that system that I'm functioning within. But it's a very troubling space to be, to be honest. And I think for many of us, we'd rather not have to grapple with these, with these different things, but that's, that's the reality that we're faced yeah. with. Yeah, I mean, I would echo what, what Heba said. I've had a different, I'd say, uh, in a, you know, to be aware of my relationship with these institutions. It's, it's been one of a traveler, it's been one of a visitor, not one of uh, a long time resident. And I feel it, that has given me windows into how many of these institutions that one can only know really, again, from the inside, you cannot go by the interface, you cannot go by the PR generated imagery and, and, and narratives about these institutions, you really need to sort of have a dive in. When I worked at the British Museum, I just did a search on just who else is named Muhammad in this whole institution. And I was the only one, and that was all I needed to know. <laughs> so- Well, uh, in their defense, it's not a very common name, I mean. Right, exactly. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, the problem is, you know, what I've noticed, for example, in a lot of these institutions is there is, uh, the, the question of uh, moving forward is one of PR. It's not one of structural change. And I feel like, being aware of that and just being true to what your work is about. You will say what you have to say. Um, if there is room for it, you will create room for it. There will be struggles. You know, I've been told, you know, your work belongs under the stair in a meeting. And I'm very happy to speak about these things publicly because more people should, right? Like in a meeting uh, that had 
the director of the British Museum visiting the department in which I was the only Egyptian in the Egyptian, Egypt and Sudan department at the British Museum. I was the only actual Egyptian who was an employee, right? And, you know, the director is there to see what the department is doing. And when I give my spiel about the Modern Egypt project, which I sort of was hired to, to work on, um, you know, one of the longtime curators there who's, of course, whatever, uh, concerned with sculpture, you know, the brutal things, the, the big stone sculptures, you know, these are that civilization, that's what we need to know. You know, he said, these ephemeral things that are basically I'm co collecting, which I chose to essentially collect trash for that institution, because I knew my position. I, I knew if something is, pro is coming into this institution today, let's look from the bottom up. So for that person, these are things that belong under the stairs. So you need to sort of manage these situations, but not forget them, don't brush them, don't sweep them under the rug. This is what it is about. This is what it's about. On the front of the face, there is something going on institutionally. And at the end, institutions are composed of individuals. So, you know, in the early 20th century, corporate lawyers in the US argued that corporations should have the same rights as people. I don't know if people know this. And this is, um, and so we tend to personify institutions, but when you have 20 people working on the image of the institution, it's very easy to be deluded by it. So again, there are tensions, of course, um, you know, there's misperceptions and you have to explain to multiple audience, what are you trying to do here and there? I honestly think clarity, sincerity, uh, being true to yourself and um, doing really the best you can to, to widen horizons, I said, like I said before, expand your circle of empathy. If you're doing all these things, whatever the subject matter is, you know, history will probably be kinder on you than someone who's in complete denial or is doing producing a narrative that might work today, but will expire tomorrow. So that's what I have to say on that. Okay. Thanks, Bernadette. Okay, the next question comes from Brahim. Uh, thank you, everybody. And uh, this is the only time my son called me by my first name, not dad, yani, on Afikra. So, uh, Muhammad, I enjoyed listening to you and also Hiba as well. Uh, but uh, both of you and Hiba particularly keep uh, referring to post-colonization. Uh, uh, and I really wonder whether this should be qualified, whether post the British colonization or which colonization, because colonization still exists. Yes. There is nothing called post, but it's moving. And now we see it very well entrenched, economically speaking, the Chinese colonization of Africa. So I wonder whether the military the occupation is really considered colonization, whether the financial occupation, which is really in my opinion, is colonization as well. So does anybody have something to say about that? Absolutely. I'm actually very adamant about um, not using the term post-colonialization yes. um, and to really address the ways in which colonialism is still very much alive today. And I think this is why it's important to really dig into those archival narratives and to contextualize the present to show the way in which it's still very much a continuation of the colonial process. Um, so, in fact, my work speaks very specifically to that. Um, so I would agree with you very much that we are still uh, within a very um, colonial, neo-colonial context is often how it's addressed now. Um, but to very adamantly um, address that, it's not, it, we're, it's not a, there is no end point. No, colonialism never went anywhere. This is really important to, to remind. And, 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 and I mean, imperialism really ma can manifest. In, if, if you have to understand things at their essence. And I feel that if, if more people see, uh, for, for example, that struggles are shared. I said, we were talking briefly before the, um, uh, before we started the live that, you know, you know, what was going on in Beirut and what's going on in Colombia, what's going on in Egypt 10 years ago, what's going on in, you know, in the United States with BLM, you know, these are connected struggles and constantly we're being told that they are not, constantly there are distractions, you know, when you, this is why I say, let's understand the history of decolonization. MLK came to Egypt, Mar Malcolm X was in Egypt before he was assassinated. 
uh, briefly, many, um, you know, African uh, independence thinkers, whether they were also from London or New York, moved to places like the Middle East. You know, James Baldwin spent a good 10 years in, in Turkey uh, when he was writing most of his, uh, in order to survive what was going on in the United States and the struggle there for, you know, African American equality. These are not separate struggles. And, you know, when we understand, we need to understand that, you know, it's 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 a little simpler actually than we're told it is and colonialism continues in different variations it's not just military you know there's also nerd imperialism going on right now tech imperialism whatever you want to call it you know those are actually things that manifest and at the end of the day if whatever it is that we're looking at there's a very simple sort of question to ask you know who is it serving is it serving people is it is it human centered uh, who's included in, in, in that project circle of empathy. Um, and, you know, the smaller it is, most likely the more racist, uh, economically exploitative, um, and most likely based in the Northern Hemisphere, unfortunately. And history is not going to forget these things or look kindly on them. And this is where I always say, it's much simpler. A human-centered, you know, kind of future is possible when we're centering the human in the present. Um, it's really, uh, which is not the case. All you have to look around, all you have to do is look around. 3.9 billion people are, which is half the planet's population are today malnutrition or hungry. I'm not sure how that's okay with the other 3.9 billion people. So whatever mechanisms are at play to make that reality possible when there is enough food to feed everyone, uh, you know, call them colonialism, call them whatever, you know, it's, it, it look at things in that lens, widen the, the, the picture, and I think things uh, become a little bit clearer. Okay, um, thanks for the question. Um... Hamad, <laughs> yeah, th exactly. Thanks for the question, Dad. <laughs> um, uh, Hamad uh, Hiba, we just hit time. I feel like we could keep on talking for another hour. Blew by. Um, and um, this was really, really fun. And thanks for to everyone on the call or listening to the podcast later on. It's very easy to find uh, both Hamad and Hiba online. There's a ton of work online. I highly recommend that you check out their websites and their various social media um, portals. Um, thanks for making time to do this. And I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having us. Thank, Thank you for having us. It was fun. Thanks everyone for, for There will be another um, episode in this series in a few weeks. So be sure to go to africa.com to keep track. And we have another event tomorrow and another event the day after that. Thank you all. Bye everybody. Have a good day or night, wherever you are.